Second note on marriage, July 1838. Reasons to marry. This is the question. Against freedom to go where one liked, conversation of clever men at clubs, not forced to visit relatives and bend in every trifle, to have the expense and anxiety of children, perhaps quarrelling, Loss of time. Four. Children, if it please God. Constant companion, a friend in old age, who will be interested in one. Home and someone to take care of house. Charms of music and female chit-chat. Object to be beloved and played with. Hmm, better than a dog, anyhow. Charles Darwin was many things, but excessively sentimental wasn't one of them. And in fact, according to many historians, the man who transformed our thinking about the natural world with his ideas about evolution was in fact the epitome of the Victorian conservative when it came to his views on women. Famously, Darwin openly attacked the philosopher John Stuart Mill's views on sexual equality. Responding to Mill's feminist work, The Subjugation of Women, Darwin laid out some very clear views in his own study the descent of man. With respect to differences of this nature between man and woman, it is probable that sexual selection has made a very important part. I am aware that some writers doubt whether there is any inherent difference, but this is at least probable from the analogy of the lower animals which present other secondary characters. No one will dispute that the bull differs in disposition from the cow, the wild boar from the sow, the stallion from the mare, and, as is well known to the keepers of menageries, the males of the larger apes from the females. Woman seems to differ from man in her mental disposition, chiefly in her greater tenderness and less selfishness. And this holds good even with savages. This is a typical Victorian perspective on the differences between the sexes. Darwin even applied his ideas on evolution to this. Arguing that men had honed their brain power and dexterity through centuries of active competition, while women had relied on physical attractiveness and were creatures of beauty, but not of intellect. But in fact, there might be more to Darwin's views on women than we sometimes think. When we describe Darwin as a cultural conservative, one important source of information gets in the way time and again, and that's a large archive of letters from women who wrote to him over the course of his life. To date, we know of around 150 women with whom Darwin exchanged letters during his lifetime. So if Darwin was such a traditionalist, why did he write to them? Who were they and what do they tell us about society at the time? By looking at these letters more closely, we can find out a lot about both the women who wrote to Darwin and the great scientist himself. The mainstream gender ideology of Victorian society essentially positioned women as moral and feeling but irrational. According to the orthodox point of view, they were ultimately destined to be domestic creatures, looking after the home and nurturing their children. But what social mores prescribed and what people actually thought were two very different things. Not everyone agreed that women's femininity should be measured by their modesty or their unwavering dedication to their family. And privately, Darwin agreed. Take this letter, which he wrote to Eleanor Mary Dicey in 1877. In it, Darwin says that women should not be excluded from studying science, should they choose to do so, even though science was, at this time, seen very much as the preserve of men alone. I should regret that any girl who wished to learn physiology should be checked, because it seems to me that this science is the best or sole one for giving to any person an intelligent view of living beings, and thus to check that credulity in various points which is so common with ordinary men and women. 
It's a view of Darwin very much at odds with his public, socially conservative persona. Darwin's letters help us to resolve these contradictions. He wrote thousands of letters in his lifetime and more than 15,000 are known to survive today. Around 9,000 live here at the University Library in Cambridge, where the Darwin Correspondence Project is systematically researching and publishing all that survive. The letters are not just an insight into Darwin's life, but an invaluable window onto Victorian science and society as a whole. They show us a different side of Darwin to the figure who, in 1871, attacked J.S. Mill for his support of women's equality. The truth is that Darwin's views on women were much more complex. In 1839, when he married his first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, he expressed the hope that she would humanise him. Emma went on to advise him and help him with the editing of some of his work, so much so that when Darwin was debating whether to publish his seminal work on the origin of species, he turned to Emma for advice. Darwin offered her two blunt choices, publish the work or burn the manuscript. And while the times in which Darwin lived seemed conservative on the surface, in fact, things were starting to change. Darwin's age marked the beginning of more than a century of dramatic changes in women's political, social and economic status. So while publicly Darwin still professed what seemed to be the establishment view, privately and in his letters, avenues were emerging through which he could express rather different opinions. And that perhaps is a better summary of where Darwin stood. Openly he towed the line, but behind closed doors he was more supportive of women, especially women who were interested in science. But that doesn't mean that Darwin was a feminist, and nor was he always aware of how far he was participating in the very early stages of a social revolution. In 1869, Antoinette Brown Blackwell sent Darwin a copy of her Studies in General Science, marked only with her surname. He responded enthusiastically, writing back to thank her with a letter which began, Dear Sir. Although science was regarded as the preserve of men, many of the women who wrote to Darwin were scientists and he was extremely supportive of them. Throughout his life, he relied on a number of scientific observers. These were women as well as men and included several members of his own family. One such figure was his daughter, Henrietta Darwin, who, perhaps surprisingly, played a key role as an editor of The Descent of Man during the 1860s. The Descent, or to give it its full title, Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, was a deeply controversial book, explicit in its content on sexual display and arguing, among other things, that sexual selection was driven ultimately by female aesthetic tastes, or at least that it was in every species except humans, Interestingly, Darwin didn't apply the same idea to his own species. But nonetheless, this was hard, almost risque science and not the sort of thing a respectable woman should really have been involved with. But Darwin valued Henrietta's judgment as an editor, and he appears to have regarded her as one of the most important critics when it came to ensuring that the book was readable. My dear H, please read the chapter first, right through without a pencil in your hand, that you may judge of general scheme, as also I particularly wish to know where the parts are extra tedious. But remember that manuscript is always much more tedious than print. Henrietta was not just an editor, however, but an observer as well. In one letter, for example, we find her writing to her father to report on the expressive behaviour of a cat so that it could inform his wider research. 1st August 1863 a young cat of about the age of 10 months, when put upon a soft cloak or gown, used to take a piece in her mouth and then pound with her claws out and purr. But conveniently available family members were not the only female members of Darwin's scientific network. In fact, his letters give us a wealth of information about other women in both Britain and beyond who were trying to break into the man's world of science in Darwin's day. Darwin actively advised and encouraged many women who were studying science privately, often without much formal education. In some cases, he even encouraged them to publish their research. One such example was Mary Treat, a naturalist from New Jersey in the United States, 
Pou during the 1870s, 80s and 90s made a series of important contributions to botanical and entomological research. Treat was a smart operator. In public, she was careful to ensure that her published writings used appropriately feminine, domestic imagery that was distanced from the more cool, detached and masculine writing of a proper scientist. But in her private correspondence with Darwin, a different side of her approach to science emerges. Listen to this extract from her very first letter, which she was encouraged to send to Darwin by Asa Gray, the famous American botanist, in 1871. I will give you my observations on Tracera, which have escaped the attention of botanists. I had two or three species of these pretty plants growing for window ornaments, and soon saw that the Tracera longifolia was a fly trap of considerable power. The unlucky fly, a common house fly, would no sooner be caught by the sticky glands of the leaf than the blade would at once commence to fold about its victim. It folded from the apex to the stem of the leaf after the manner of its vernation. So here, away from the public eye, Treat was authoritative, confident and direct. She was also much more technical and scientific in her style. And throughout her career, she was always constrained to some extent by the male-dominated society in which she lived. But there's also no doubt that Darwin encouraged her to keep up her scientific investigations. Your observations and experiments on the sexes of butterflies are by far the best, as far as known to me, which have ever been made. They seem to me so important that I earnestly hope that you will repeat them and record the exact numbers of the larvae which you tempt to continue feeding and deprive of food and record the sexes of the mature insects. Assuredly, you ought then to publish the result in some well-known scientific journal. One of the interesting things about the women who wrote with Darwin is that they didn't just include scientists. In fact, he seems to have been in touch fairly regularly with women in Britain, America and the rest of the world who challenged the social mores of the day and to some extent anticipated the suffragette movement. These women could be called proto-feminists. We don't often see these women writing to Darwin about their political views. Often they wrote about botany or science in general, just like his other women correspondents. But the frequency with which these people turn up in the letters does show us that Darwin's ideas were registering on a more radical level beyond the scientific world. They were registering with a group of Victorian women who certainly were not conservatives when it came to ideas about gender. Take this woman, Florence Dixie. She wasn't a feminist as we understand the term today, but she was a well-known 19th century traveller who wrote extensively about her globetrotting and who certainly didn't live the unassuming and domesticated lifestyle that was expected for women in her day. Over the course of several letters, she struck up an increasingly friendly correspondence with Darwin, in which she furnished him with accounts of observations she'd made during her travels in Patagonia. In one particularly colourful incident, we hear about how Florence stumbled across a family of pumas. Rather brutally, she ended up chasing the mother puma up a tree and shooting it. However, a baby puma from the same family was more fortunate. Florence fell for its cute looks and decided to adopt it and ship it back to Windsor where she lived. There she raised it as if it was a dog, regularly taking it for walks in a nearby park. The story has a sad end, however. One day the puma was let off the leash and attacked and killed a dog while out for a walk. After that, Florence's puma was deemed too dangerous for polite society and was relocated to London Zoo. But if Florence Dixie wasn't a feminist, another of Darwin's correspondents, Lydia Becker, definitely was. Born in 1827, Lydia was a Manchester-based activist and secretary of the National Society of Women's Suffrage. She's gone down in history as a pioneer of the suffrage movement, which ultimately brought women the vote and acknowledged their right to participate in every aspect of society in an equal manner. She was also a keen scientist and in 1864 even succeeded in publishing Botany for Novices, a book which was released using only her initials and in which she carefully crafted her writing style to ensure that it looked like the work of a man. But for women like Becker, science and politics went hand in hand. Her aim was to demonstrate that science was something that everyone could participate in, regardless of their gender. Between 1863 and 1877, Becker and Darwin exchanged several letters. Most of them were about botany. Becker sent Darwin samples of plants from Manchester, 
adding detailed observations that enabled him to further his research on plant dimorphism. In return, Darwin helped Becker to pursue her own budding career as a scientist, replying to questions, giving her feedback on her own writing, and helping her to get published. In a letter of 1866, Becker made a specific plea on behalf of the newly formed Manchester Ladies Literary Society, which, despite its name, had a strongly scientific agenda. 21st of May, 1863. Sir, I have this day forwarded to you a small box containing plants of lycnes, which I hope will reach you tomorrow in tolerably good condition. I have also enclosed a tin canister of flowers, and I hope there will be pollen enough to enable you, if you please, to try the experiment of fertilising it with some of the plants grown in your neighbourhood. In reply, Darwin didn't just send one letter, he sent three. It seems unlikely that Darwin was entirely ignorant of Becker's political interests beyond science. Becker sent him a pamphlet on the Manchester Ladies Literary Society and, on one occasion, she wrote to him on the headed paper of the Manchester National Society for Women's Suffrage. 22nd of December, 1866. Living in a town has its advantages. Among others, it makes possible such societies as that indicated in the circular I have taken the liberty of enclosing. A few ladies have joined together, hoping for much pleasure and instruction from their little society, which is quite in its infancy and needs a helping hand. Am I altogether too presumptuous in seeking this help from you? Our petition is, would you be so very good as to send us a paper to be read at our first meeting? In the end, uh, what Darwin's letters show us is that, like many Victorians, his personal views about women were rather different from his public image. Contrary to the things he openly said about women, in private, he was at the very least happy to collaborate with and encourage female scientists, and perhaps even feminists, like Becker. We need to remember that Darwin himself was a man who already had controversial scientific views, which meant that the last thing he could afford to do was make yet more unpalatable statements about gender. So perhaps in a struggle to gain acceptance, he decided to toe the establishment line when it came to women. If so, then his letters are all the more important because they tell a more complex story of a man forced to split his public and private worlds in order to guarantee success for the work that would ensure that he went down in history as one of the greatest scientists of all time. Perhaps more importantly, his letters give us a rare opportunity to explore the lives of women from the same era who were striving, whether in science, society or both, to gain themselves an equal footing with men. Unlike women today, they had barely any role models to draw on, which makes their achievements all the more inspiring. But this is not just a story of inspiration. The letters of women like Mary Treat or Lydia Becker, each in their own way, are the story of a struggle in which making sexual equality a reality often seemed a case of swimming against the tide of public opinion. That struggle, especially for women in science, is far from over. Schools in the UK still struggle to encourage girls to take science past GCSE, and more than 70% of women science graduates end up going into non-science related careers. In the UK, men are still reckoned to be six times more likely to take up careers in science, technology, engineering or maths. If we really want to honour the achievements of the women whose words we read in Darwin's letters, we should do more than celebrate their lives. We should pick up where they left off.